eight random questions here. Okay. You pick three numbers, one at a time, because I will not remember what you pick. Okay. And then whatever question they correspond to, that's where we start. I'm understanding. So, one through eight, what is your first number? Uh, seven. Number set. yay, you hit my favorite one. This one is called Scream. So there's obviously only one question I could be asking now. What's your favorite scary movie? Oh, uh, um, the original Candyman, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> excellent choice, mm -hmm. excellent choice. Yeah. Do you have a favorite horror subgenre? I like a, like a psychological thriller, if that can count as a horror. Like Very when much. I think about, like, um, Oh my gosh, why am I forgetting the name now? Clarice. Oh, uh, Silence of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> like, I can help you with these. <laughs> when I think of Silence of the Lambs, that's, that's, that's freaky. We need you in a horror movie now. I mean, let's see, let's okay. see who's around. I speak things into existence on I Ladies love that. Night. Now it's For gonna me. happen. Yeah. What's, do you wanna speak like a pool into existence? Wait, like, well, uh, well, I'm gonna speak an Emmy nomination into existence. I have no problem saying that out loud, because <laughs> I say things that are, are true, and I okay. think I say things that are deserving as well. But I'm gonna say one more thing to try to manifest it. Of all of the iconic horror franchises out there, if you could join one, which one would you pick oh. and why? Huh. Um, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like people have fun on the Chucky movies. I just feel like that's like a fun like set. I would do that. Or I would do like a Saw movie and really just get like, Something freaky happens to me. Both are still going. Yeah, Both are yeah, alive, alive and thriving I mean, right or now. Or Final Destination reboot. Well, they're making a new one. I don't know where they are with casting, but the directors who are making that movie are A plus guys, and I feel like that should happen. Great, we're manifesting okay. things right here. <laughs> Before I spend all of the time on one question, what is your second number? This interview with my my <laughs> shadow agent. Um, uh, my second number is four. All right, number four is also a fun, silly one. There is a zombie outbreak. Oh, you no. could pick two past co-stars to team up with. Who do you pick oh. to give yourself the best chance of surviving? Absolutely Eben. I think Eben wants back rack. He's tall, he, he works out, but not too much. He's got like good survival skills. He can, he can cook, I feel like He'd be, he'd be a good, yeah, I feel like he'd be like a good survivalist. And then, um, I don't know, I'm, I might have to do two bear people. I, yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking of the, of the roster and I don't really know, I don't really know. It's, I'm like also a weak link for sure. What's your, what's your greatest skill and your greatest weakness in that kind of scenario? Oh, I think I can keep the vibe up. <laughs> vibe, is a, vibe is important. I'm dying. I'm dying in the zombie apocalypse, and I know that. Um, yeah, and then my greatest weakness, I think I don't, I don't really know how to do many things. <laughs> I'm a good runner, but I can't do things like cook. Oh, I can so run. I would like starve Oh, to I can cook. Do okay, you we'll, team, we'll team up. Yeah, well, I don't know, can you like, like start a fire though? That's a problem. Mm. I don't know if I could start a fire yeah. so you could cook. I don't know. <laughs> okay, yeah. I might just have to peace out on that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah we got to brush, yeah. brush up on our skills and we'll revisit this conversation yes. at a later date. All right, your last number here. My last number, I'm going to say, let's do one. All right, number one is, I'm glad you landed on this one because before I came here, I was watching your interview with Haley Steinfeld from oh, Tribeca. Yeah. And now that I know you're really good at interviewing, I want you to do my job for me and tell me which question you wish more people would ask about the acting process in these kinds of scenarios. Oh, God, I don't really know, honestly. I am I have a hard time talking about process. I feel like I am not um, that type of person. I'm not like method acting or anything. Um, yeah, I don't really know. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty solid with the, with the questions I've, I've gotten. Um, I like just like dumb questions. I dumb? Feel like more dumb questions. I mean, yeah. I could I could give you one more. Let me give you, you one more dumb, dumb question. One? Yeah, yeah let's I'll do give it. you my turtle specific question. Oh sure. So it's called your pizza. I want to know what your like food version of their pizza is. Like the thing that you could eat all day, every day, in any variation imaginable. Ooh, um, I really like Japanese food. I really like like curry, like Japanese. Curry, even though I'm half Caribbean, so you know what I mean. Like I, I love Caribbean curry too, low roti situation. But like Japanese curry, I feel like I could just eat nonstop, especially because they have like the little like pickled, like 
radish on the side, okay. like, like red pickled radish, you know, cuts it. Solid choice, and again, a whole lot of variation. So yeah. if you have to eat it over and over, you're, right. you're safe. I'm okay. okay, yeah. Make it spicy, make it not. I feel like it's like not as portable, so like if I had to go on some sort of sewer-based adventure, I'd have a bit of a tough time. <laughs> I want them to animate Japanese that into a sequel curry. now. But um, you know what I mean, all you can do is dream. What is up, everyone? Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night with someone who I've been eager to get on the show, Iowa Debris. Congratulations on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem, which is exceptional and like a, a whole bunch of things that you have accomplished very oh, recently wow. that we will talk about. Okay, yeah, thank you. What is the, the first movie you saw, performance you saw, personal experience you had, you name it, that made you say to yourself, I have to, well for you it could be different, I have to be an actor, I have to be a comedian, I have to be a writer, you do so many things. Oh man, I, that's so interesting thing. Um, the first <laughs> piece of stand-up that I really was obsessed with, um, my crush gave me an, a rip of um, Dane Cook's like live from Madison Square Garden, and I remember I like downloaded it onto the family computer, and it gave us like a virus. <laughs> um, but then that kind of like I was like, whoa, stand up. And then I got really into like Cat Williams, like that early Dave Chappelle and like Chappelle show, um, and that just opened the floodgates. But transformative experience, I would say, seeing Wicked when I was in speaks to me. When I was in elementary school, that was that was very transformative. That did a lot of damage. I can understand that. That did a lot of damage. I went to school at NYU, okay. and I spent every free dollar I had seeing Wicked over and over. Sometimes and over. you just gotta. I saw it. I saw it recently. Um, I saw it very recently, and I cried. I cried three times. Whatever. I don't, I don't blame you. I've been there as well. So you have those sources of inspiration, but then you go to school and get a teaching degree. What yeah. inspired that? Well, I didn't finish my teaching degree, so there's that. <laughs> um, I really like working with people. I like working with kids, and I really love history. I love English. So I think before I could conceptualize doing something like this as an actual career path, that was a job that made sense to me, and I knew there were skills in that job that I, I was decent at. The actual teaching part, I don't know, not so much really. Um, but that felt like a job where I told myself like, I could do this day to day and feel like I'm doing a good thing and like I'm happy and it's related to creativity and you're working with kids and uh, maybe I can like do improv or comedy on like the nights and weekends. All right, that sounds like a fair balance. And I know I know you did some of that with classes and stuff, but first, mm. is that where you met Rachel when you went to school there? Went, yeah, at NYU, yeah. What was the first thing that happened between the two of you that signaled to you like, this could be a good creative partner for me? We were talking about this recently because for her, she remembers, we did this sketch together and she remembers like watching me in the sketch and then being like, oh, something's here. But I just remember being at a party and um, <laughs> Rachel was like drunk <laughs> and she was like talking to somebody and she was like, I don't care what anybody says, like I'm gonna be doing stand up and like you can do it in, in the city. And I was like, who is this? She's. Uh, I, she's a lot, but I think I love her. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was like an A-plus impression. I feel like I could hear that in her voice as you said it. <laughs> Spend a lot of time together. She has been on Ladies' Night in the past. I'm going to give you a question where I just like remember her answer so vividly. I also okay. love this question. But when you decide you want to get into this business, whether mm. it's being a working actor, a comedian, whatever, what do you think the first step to doing that is? And now having done it, would you recommend that first step to an aspiring actor out there? or suggest something else? I think I thought the first step, I don't know, was just like getting signed. And I didn't know what that meant or how to do it. So I was just like cold calling people nonstop. I was just like sending crazy emails to you like did it too. managers and agents. Yeah, that's why we're friends. That's what, that's what she said. Rachel she... gave me the idea probably. Oh God. So now, now that I'm thinking about it. She told it. me she emailed the Twilight casting director asking to be background. I emailed um, because my dad got the email. This is so insane. Did you ever watch <laughs> The Affair? Yes. That woman, why can't I remember her last name? Mara um, uh, Tierney. Ma Mara Tierney, who's from Boston. <laughs> Somebody my dad worked with 
is her cousin. And so I got her email and I sent her my resume. Mind you, like I was in college. <laughs> so this isn't like like an early dream. Like I was like, <laughs> I could vote. Um, and I sent her an email with my resume and like my headshot. And I was like, I write, like I produce, like I act like, but I'll do whatever. Like I'll clean up the porta potties. Like please Mara Tierney, like what do you need girl? Um, and obviously she never emailed me back. That's literally, don't ever do that. If don't, don't ever, don't do that. I will say I did that and I got a response and an offer for an internship. But that's different because you went to like a job, or like a person who can give you a job. No. I went to Mara Tierney who was like an actress I on The Affair. I emailed a producer of a major film franchise but that's out like of the a blue. a producer, you know what I mean? It's not okay. like Mara Tierney <laughs> in The Affair. Like if somebody emailed me for a job on The Bear, don't do that. Like with <laughs> love and respect and like hope for your career, don't send me an email, don't do that. Of all of your earliest jobs, or I guess any job for that matter, mm. which one do you credit with putting into focus most what is most important to you in terms of the stories you're telling and the types of onset environments you work in? Oh, I mean, I mean, I think the bear for sure. It's just such like a beautiful, positive experience, and our, it's such a. Um, a show that I know can be stressful to watch, but Very. filming it is so gentle, is so just focused on the work um, and just getting it done and, and being decent to each other. I'll jump to that one briefly then. Um, when you first signed on for The Bear, what is something about Sydney's journey and who she was that you were most looking forward to playing? But then also, what is something that popped up along the way about her that was more creatively fulfilling than you ever could have imagined? Um, I was really looking forward to like taking cooking classes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, wow, I feel like a real actress. I'm learning just a, a skill. Uh, I was always very jealous of that whenever you see like some actor on um, like a late night show and they're like flipping butterfly knives or whatever. Um, I can't do that, but I can I can make a really good Maybe roast chicken. Maybe we should will you into a uh, zombie apocalypse movie and then you'd have a reason to like learn skills like yeah, that. I just feel like that though I would be like muddy a lot of the like the I filming mean, yeah. process. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be too muddy. Um, yeah, but I really enjoyed the fact that she's flawed and I think she feels like a real human being to me. Uh, she's not perfect, she makes mistakes. She makes a lot of mistakes, <laughs> but she tries to learn and grow from them. And yeah, that the journey is not super linear is, is very exciting. Before I jump into too many specific titles here, I wanted to ask you about working with number ones on the call sheet. Because mm. when, when you find a special one that really sets the right kind of tone and environment on set, it's really important. And you've got quite a few here, like Haley Steinfeld, Quinta Brunson, Jeremy Allen White. Do you find that a great number one on the call sheet has any shared trait? Where all three of them have it, but then also can you tell me something different about each of them that you know sets the tone in a unique way on each production? I mean, they're all just incredibly skilled, I think, and have really hard, uh, impressive work ethics, which I feel like is definitely something that trickles down. But also just like kindness, patience, having a good attitude, that's all very important. And they're all different people in their own ways, but I think those are definitely shared traits that they all have, yeah. It's that simple, if only everyone would realize it's I that mean, simple. I mean, yeah, but it's also like, it's not when you're getting up at like three in the morning and Fair you're enough. in makeup for two hours and or scripts are changing or, you know, like setups change. There's a lot of people always wanting your attention, like, but also it, it's like, that's part of the job and that's like the fun and so. Okay, I'll, I'll go with that for a minute. Can you kind of like peel back the curtain and share maybe a time on any set you were on where like the pressure was high, you were stressed and you needed to find some sort of like relaxing outlet or a support in order to, you know, power through it and get the job done well? I mean, on bottoms, it was just so hot in New Orleans. Oh, oh no. It was just hot. And we and Rachel are playing these like troubled teenage lesbians who are just wearing like huge polos. Every t-shirt is bigger than God. <laughs> um, and yeah, we were just, we were all very hot and we were doing a lot of stunts outside. Um, and it was also, we were shooting overnights. So that was like, you're just tired because you get to set at like, 3 p.m. and then you're like there at three in the morning and you're like, is time real? Um, are any of us, are we all sort of astral projecting? And maybe yes, um, but uh, 
we were make we were like making TikToks together, <laughs> just like to de stress, um, and that was cool. Yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, when you're working on a film and a character like that, a character that you know, like, make some bad decisions. Sometimes she's mean, but you need to make sure you never sever that connection to the viewer, and the viewer is always rooting for her no matter what. So what is the key to being able to swing big in those respects but never lose that connection to the viewer? To be honest, I think I don't really think about the viewer. <laughs> I think if you're thinking about how people are going to receive something, it's, like, impossible to tap into the character. So I think just, like, making sure that you are connecting with the director whose vision it is and with the other actors around you to make sure that you're keeping like the the story straight and the emotions there even though like bottoms is like a crazy comedy but it's like if we as long as we're locked in with each other like that's what matters the most and like Emma's locked in but we we did do a lot of in prep, like we would go like page by page, line by line, like tracking the emotions, making sure she felt like an actual person to me underneath all the ridiculous things she's saying. Or Is doing. that something specific to Bottoms or do you like to approach all your roles that way? I think that's something that was specific to that process with Emma for sure. Do you have a like a consistent thing you like to do to prep for all these roles? Uh, I mean like really truly honestly, the one thing that popped in my mind was that I just watch a lot of like like Miss Marple sort of vibe stuff like while I'm filming. Okay. Like, things like psych monk. Like I like like procedurals that just kind of like soothe my brain a little bit so I can just like focus on work. I respect that choice. Uh, going back to Rachel briefly because Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's the first time you acted opposite one another since your since uh, 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 so, yeah, Rachel, uh, and, uh, Rachel, and, I Rachel and I are single. single. Yes. Yeah. So, what is something about your collaboration that stayed the same from that to Bottoms, but also what is a new layer that you had to add mm. to suit Bottoms? I think Rachel and I have always been able to bounce off of each other really well, just like even as friends, but. Uh, so I think, yeah, there's always been like a baseline of banter that we have and this understanding of each other's voices. But since that time, so much life, I think, happened for the both of us, personally and professionally. And I just had this really crazy sense of like, wow, we both have just grown so much, like in our actual skill set. And so we were able to bring our different areas of knowledge to this one project and just like sort of help each other. It was it was really honestly like one of the best experiences. We were in like a honey wagon, like sharing a honey wagon, like in the middle of like lightning storms in New Orleans. But we just felt like we were sharing a comedy brain. Like it was dope. Literally where I'm going on Thursday and um, all the talk about heat there is just like making me sweat early. I, I don't want to <laughs> say anything negative about New Orleans because, but it was really hot. I've been and warned. there were lightning storms. And the, there the leather were also, jacket stays here. Yeah. There were, there were termite swarms where the <gasps> termites would be mating and they would be in the sky. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't. Oh yeah. no, I'm gonna Google this later, and it's gonna keep me up at night. And it's just gonna like be don't film oh like a fault. teen lesbian sex comedy at night uh, across from a lake, and I feel like you'll be fine. But <gasps> there were there were like there were like oh, no. all these crew members. <laughs> we would all be like so hot, and they would just be like, "Hey, don't worry, baby. Like, trust me. Like, this isn't even that bad." Once. Uh, I left to go to work, and I came back, and I had no steps. And you'd just be like, what are you talking about? Um, and they'd be like, the termites, you know? So, yeah. But New Orleans is cool, okay. jazz. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'll be fine. Beignets. Yeah. The, Zatarans. I'll just keep thinking about those keywords. Mm. Um, for Turtles now, one of my favorite things about this movie is that it feels like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles I grew up with and mm. know and love so much, but it also feels uniquely its own and like it can be an on-ramp for someone who has never seen anything Turtles related in their life. So with that in mind, what is something about previous iterations of April that you wanted to hold tight to, but then also what's something you deliberately did to make this version of the character your own? Mm, I mean, I, I think the fact that she's like, like a journalist that she's got this friendship and this bond with them um, and is such an iconic character to people. I feel like there's just a lot of people who have so much fondness for her, a lot of <laughs> early first crushes. Um, but I loved that in this iteration, I felt like she just had so much agency and was her own person uh, and had her own goals and 
with that, knowing that, wanted to, like, uses that or feels that in tandem with the turtles, if that makes sense. Like, she has her own goal, she has her own drive. She wants to, you know, crack a story, but she realizes throughout the journey of the movie also how important friendship is with these little turtle freaks, so, yeah. The chemistry in this is impeccable. Is it safe to assume that you did get to do your sessions with the other actors? I got to do some, but mostly the boys were just going together and then I was like responding to th their everything. <laughs> is there anything you heard one of them do in one of their recordings that like, like shocked you and maybe brought something out of your own character that you didn't expect? There's a, I mean, what it did bring out in me, I think, was the feeling of being like a teenage girl around teenage boys. We were just like, oh my God, um, okay, yes, absolutely. Um, either I will just sort of be silent and watch this or I will just say, this is dumb. Um, and which, like, in, in a loving, fun way. I got it. Um, yeah, because, yeah, if, you're a, if you've been a teenage girl, then you know that feeling. Um, but yeah, I, uh, there's a, there's a bacon, egg, and cheese yes. bit that is, that was really shocking to me. Um, <laughs> that was just really shocking um, and is incredible. But I was like, I was just shocked by it. It yeah. goes on for a it while goes too, on for and so it's great. Long. It goes on for yes. just as long as it needs to. And I think me, I, I, I think I don't know if I was there for that one or one other moment, but I just remember really being like, okay, yep, uh-huh, yep, okay. And then like in the actual film, it's like me being like, uh-huh, yeah, okay. It's All right. just like one of many pitch perfect moments yeah. in this movie. I have to wrap with you soon. I will end with one silly question. I play a would you rather acting game fairly often and one particular question suits your character in this movie quite well. Would you rather have to fake sneeze or fake vomit in a scene? Devastating. Um. Fake sneeze. I feel like I've done, I've actually done my fair share of fake vomiting, believe it or not. I would love to do a fake sneeze. I love like um, in Bridge of Spies, Tom Hanks, how he just like has a cold throughout the whole movie. He was basic. I think that's like so sick. It's not the reference I was expecting to hear during a Turtles interview, it's, but I like it. It's I the like one it. that I gave. <laughs> unfortunately the one that I gave. I could talk to you all day because you have so much wonderful stuff to celebrate. So Thank the door to Ladies nice. Night is open anytime you want. Congratulations on Mutant Mayhem, Bottoms, Theater Camp, The Bear, and everything to come in the future. Thank you so much.